All right. Well, it's 11 o'clock and I always like a prompt. So I'll go ahead and get started and people just kind of keep rolling. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Robin Hansen. I'm the programs manager at California Rangeland Trust. Uh, we got a lot of great experts here to speak to you all, so I won't take up too much of your time. Just a couple housekeeping things. Um, after each presentation, we've allocated a couple minutes for questions and answers, so feel free to type your questions into the uh, chat bar, and then we will get to those at the end of each presentation. And then if we don't get to them, then we'll have some time at the very end of the presentation to wrap up. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be a webinar, or I mean a webinar, a survey. So if you could complete that quick survey, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, this presentation will be recorded and we will send out the recording later this week to everyone who registered along with a list of contacts of the presenters. If do you have any questions for them? Uh, first off, we will hear from our CEO of the Rangeland Trust, Michael Delbar. Thanks, Robin. Uh, so I'm Michael Delbar, as Robin said, the CEO of the Rangeland Trust, and I want to welcome all of you to be uh, for being part of this today. The Rangeland Trust was founded 26 years ago by the California Cattlemen's Association because at the time there were some funding available to do conservation easements on these private working lands throughout the state but no organization really understood how conservation easements work or why ranches do what they do. So the cattlemen thought, well, we'll start our own land trust and we'll see what happens. And so fast forward 26 years, the California Range Land Trust is the largest statewide land trust in the state of California. We have just a hair under 400,000 acres conserved representing 94 ranching families. And there's another 95 or so ranching families in the queue representing another 250,000 acres. So what we're doing works. And the partnership that we have with our landowner partners and their commitment to pursue conservation is something we don't take lightly. So a year ago, with the help of three private funders, we created the programs department or added conservation to bring, and we brought Robin on board to, to lead this effort and at the end of the day, you know, conserving the land is only the first part of our mission. Uh, the rest is to provide our ranchers with access to resources and tools they need to steward their lands. Uh, so in June, Robin and some other partners put together a Conserving Your Legacy workshop in San Luis Obispo. Uh, that workshop was sold out and extremely well received, so much that we're planning another Conserving Your Legacy workshop in Stockton in October. And Robin will tell you a little bit more about that at the end of the webinar. So Robin talks to our landowner partners across the state and she's garnered a plethora of, of suggested workshops and webinars. And this is the first webinar that uh, she's come up with and we're really excited to have this today. And this is our first one on virtual fencing. So with that, I want to introduce Nathaniel Slinkert from Vince to tell us a little bit more about how virtual fencing works and the cost associated with that. So with that, Nathaniel, all yours. Great. Well, thank you, Michael and Robin, for the introduction. Um, so I am with Vince, um, and Vince has been around since uh, 2016 and is the uh, first commercially scaled uh, virtual fence solution to make its way into the U.S. We are a U.S.-based company uh, headquartered in San Diego, and roughly two years ago, we were acquired by Merck Animal Health. So with that, uh, before I go into a technology overview, it's really important that we, first of all, answer the question, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And I believe in the next slide, uh, uh, Dean Anderson, who is one of the pioneers of virtual fencing, a former researcher with USDA in, in New Mexico, I believe he summarizes it best with this statement. When it comes to managing animals, every conventional fence that I have ever built has been in the wrong place the next year. And uh, what we are dealing with is a very dynamic environment that our producers are grazing their animals in. And we have this in D Dean Anderson's own words, we've been using these static tools, namely um, 
physical fencing in particular or, or poly wire uh, to manage a dynamic um, uh, environment. Uh, and so his passion was to find a, a dynamic tool uh, in the form of virtual fencing uh, to uh, address this issue. Uh, incidentally, if you go back to the, um, the early marketing uh, posters for barbed wire, wire fence uh, is that um, they were to they were initially targeting uh, installing barbed wire along railroad tracks to keep the animals out of uh, out of harm's way uh, on the railroad tracks. So that was the primary problem they were trying to solve in the 1870s uh, with the expansion of our railroad infrastructure. So now on to the technology. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this is a summary of Vence's technological solution. There are other solutions out there, uh, but this is how we do it. Uh, each adult animal, we often work with cow-calf pairs, uh, but each adult animal uh, wears a collar and that collar has a GPS uh, receiver in it. And periodically, the caller will get a GPS location reading uh, from a GPS satellite, and it relays that uh, position uh, up through what we call a gateway, uh, which utilizes LoRaWAN technology, uh, which is a, a radio frequency technology to uh, communicate uh, with, the, with the callers. And then that information is relayed back up through a cellular backhaul to our cloud services, and then back to um, our uh, user interface, which is a web-based application called Herd Manager. Uh, so when a, uh, a caller receives a, a GPS location, it compares that location where the animal is with the location of the of the virtual boundaries that are programmed into that collar as well. And when the animal ventures um, near the uh, virtual boundary, the number of GPS readings increases so that we can better manage the animal. And then if the animal enters that boundary region, they first receive a, an audio cue that tells them, oh, okay, I'm, I'm headed in the wrong direction. I better turn around. And if they choose to keep going, then they will also get a periodic electrical pulse. And um, then they realize, okay, I've gone too far. Um, I will talk a little bit more about how that works on, a, on another slide, but so this is the basic platform here uh, that enables us to do uh, the magic that we do here. So. Let's go on to the next slide and I'll give you more details on the collar. So on the right, you see a sample collar assembly. There's the housing that includes a single use battery. That's where all the electronics are. Uh, there is uh, a memory chip there that's capable of, of uh, containing 16 virtual fence assignments and you can schedule those virtual fence assignments to turn on and turn off uh, based on a calendar of events. Uh, so you can lay out your, your grazing plan in advance and have that programmed into, your, uh, into the callers. Um, the, the audio pulse uh, or the audio cue comes from the, uh, the housing itself. There's a small speaker there. And then uh, to deliver the electrical pulse, we do that through the chains on either side of the neck. They act as positive and negative electrodes. And then there's a plastic bridge to isolate those uh, positive and negative leads. And we attach the collar and make adjustments uh, using these uh, locking carabiners on either side of the collar. Next slide. And this uh, image on the left here is uh, uh, one of our uh, solar powered base stations. Uh, and uh, so it can operate autonomously uh, with batteries that store the, the uh, solar energy. 
And at the top of this antenna, which is about 20 feet high here, is our LoRaWAN uh, communication antenna that uh, sends and receives signals um, to and from the, the callers. And then uh, there's also a cellular antenna. Um, and you can see the footprint is roughly about, oh, four feet by four feet. And then it's roughly about five feet tall. And so uh, before we deploy uh, these base stations, we generate a coverage model, which is shown on the right here. And the green areas indicate uh, good to excellent coverage. The blue or purplish blue, um, it would be fair to good coverage. And uh, a note to make here is that it is uh, topography dependent. We cannot generate radio waves through uh, mountains, at least not yet. And so we go through an exercise to determine the locations and how many base stations are needed to uh, provide coverage. And you can see this is an example of a 40,000 uh, acre allotment in the Colorado Rockies. And it looks like we've uh, installed at this site about five base stations to cover that, um, that territory. Next slide. And this is an example of what our uh, user interface features are. Uh, you can group your callers and animals, therefore, uh, into individual herds. And those herds um, ha can have their own virtual fence uh, configurations associated with them. And you can track your animals. As you see on the left, this shows uh, the current locations of where your animals are. And then we have grazing features that show the distribution over a period of time. You can select a time window to generate um, uh, an image of where your herd was um, over a given period. And the, the image at the top on the right here is a distribution, uh, a total distribution over about a two week period. And the one below that is, um, uh, an example of an individual animal tracking. And you can click on each one of these pins here uh, in this individual tracking image uh, to, to, to see what the timestamp is of when they were at that location. Next slide. And this is how a virtual fence works. Think of it as a one-way gate. Uh, break through a virtual uh, boundary. Uh, uh, first of all, they will reach a sound only zone where they get a beeping sound. Uh, and then if they choose to continue, they will get a combination uh, and series of uh, sound and, and electrical cues. And if they keep going and clear this entire boundary, uh, they're free, they're free to roam. Uh, we found that with proper training, uh, before turning your animals out with the collars, uh, they will recognize these sound cues pretty quickly. Uh, and, but if they do break out, we often find that uh, they will want to rejoin the herd. And there is no pressure applied to them when they uh, want to rejoin the herd. So if they go back um, through the virtual boundary, they will re not receive any stimuli. Next slide. And you, it's good to think of virtual fencing as one element that provides pressure among many. And we all know our animals are uh, constantly adapting to new stimuli in their environments, um, in, whether it's weather, whether it's predators, fire, um, whether it's pressure to, to want to um, access more forage in another pasture, uh, uh, whether it's uh, water sources, uh, whether it's a calf, um, and, and terrain provides its own pressure. Um, and so it's good to keep in mind that uh, virtual fencing is just one element at, uh, among many that influence the animals. And so uh, it's not 100% 
uh, don't expect 100% containment because other pressures may have a, a higher budget level than virtual fencing. So it's good to keep all of this in mind and especially planning things such as water uh, access accordingly. Next slide. And so here's a price summary. Uh, our base stations are roughly $10,000 each. And if you wish to have a uh, vents person come out and help you install it, there's an additional 2,500 to cover travel and labor expenses. Um, the collars are not purchased. They're based on an annual subscription of $40 per collar per year. And then the single use uh, battery um, is a, a single um, charge of, of $10 per battery. Um, on, on average, a single battery will get you through uh, an entire grazing season, provided you're not doing too much intensive targeted grazing. Uh, if you are going to do a lot of intensive targeted grazing, you're probably going to need to swap batteries out um, at least once. Uh, and then so on the right, there's a summary of an example of 300 collars and, and two, two towers. Uh, and next slide, I believe that's leaving us a little time, maybe for one and a half questions. Yeah, so Nathaniel, um, one of the questions um, we got is um, if there's any troubleshooting for the program, um, how do people navigate that? And then how accessible is that support? Okay, very good. Uh, so yes, we have a team that we call our rancher success team. And um, they, uh, so you will have a rancher success specialist assigned to you that will uh, assist you with any kind of logistical uh, and technical issues you may encounter along the way as well as provide onboarding training. Perfect. And then the other question we see um, relates to the battery length. And so uh, Michael had asked, um, you're saying that the battery lasts one year, is that correct? Yes, um, it, it, it depends on the use case. Uh, so um, most of our callers are being deployed on large rangeland applications where uh, large cow calf, I should say, uh, where uh, the the moves or from pasture to pasture are maybe occurring once a week, once every other week, depending on um, you know the the uh, available forage. Um, uh, when you get into um, more intensive targeted grazing, maybe making moves on a daily basis, then yeah, it'll greatly diminish the uh, battery life um, a, as a result. So uh, I would say in those cases, you know, it might be anywhere from three to six months would be your, your battery life. So keep that in mind. Well, perfect. Um, those of you that are sending in additional questions um, in the chat and Q&A, um, we can come back to those at the end. We're going to move forward with those, and then we'll also send out an email to um, have those additional questions as well. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Nathaniel. All right, next up, we have David Lyle from Lassen County's Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor to discuss his two-year project using virtual fencing on cattle grazing on public lands. Go ahead, David. Hold on, I think you're muted. There you go. Okay, I am muted and I'm, oh, there's the slide. Okay, excellent. Yeah, okay, thanks. So uh, the focus of our work has been on public lands grazing. And, you know, we are collecting data. We are, um, you know, doing some of that, but we're not doing real uh, replicated research or anything like that. We're really coming at this from a application, a user standpoint. And, and is this going to be a tool that we can use in a practical manner uh, on public rangelands? So next slide.
Our experience to date, uh, we are in our second grazing season. We've got uh, one project on a BLM allotment and one project on a forest service allotment. And our cooperators and our project areas are in Lassen and Modoc counties. Right now, we've got something over 600 cows uh, enrolled with our cooperators, and that includes pears, dry cows, and some bulls as well. Next slide. So some of the key questions that we, you know, kind of asked that were, you know, drivers to us initiating this work and, and that we've tried to answer as we've gone along is, you know, really basically, do these systems work on our landscapes and our grazing systems? I mean, just really fundamentally. And then the second part of that is, you know, if, if they work and they're effective at, at controlling cows, um, you know, how can we apply that as a management tool to meet objectives? And on public lands, that's going to be rancher production and economic objectives, as well as uh, conservation and range health objectives. I would say at this point, you know, we feel like, yeah, we can check that top bullet pretty much. You know, that's that's been working for us. I think in terms of how we use it, that's still uh, something that we're learning. We're investigating several different applications, but I think we're just scratching the surface at this point. Um, and again, some of the key objectives on public lands, multiple use and conservation, that's going to be an agency objective. And, and I don't mean that it's not also a rancher or a permittee objective, but that's that's an agency mandate. Um, and then, yeah, we've got some objectives around production benefits with improved distribution, potentially some access to grazing areas that haven't been uh, open to grazing because of one reason or another. And then also this uh, use of the tracking function to reduce time and cost of checking on animals and, and then gathering at the end of the season. So we'll go through these a little bit going forward. Next slide. So just again, a little bit about public lands grazing and public land grazers, you'll already know this, but you know, there's a lot going on out there besides just uh, livestock grazing and, and production. And so, you know, you'll have uh, restoration activities maybe around uh, riparian areas and stream courses. You'll have, um, you know, native plant restoration or invasive species control. Uh, you've got cultural resources that are out there being managed. You've got recreation, you've got a whole host of other things going on that as a livestock manager, you're managing around kind of in an integrated way. And, and we think that the virtual fencing systems have, have potential to help us address those. Next slide. And then the other big one is wildfires and grazing. And I know everyone is well aware of, you know, the increase in fires and the, the increase in size of fires and, and all that that we've seen over the last 10 years. And so with that comes an increase in using grazing for fine fuels reduction. Um, again, and we've had places that maybe were covered in forests or shrubs or, or something that have burned and now you've got uh, grass there and a potential grazing resource uh, that's an opportunity. Another downside though, that comes with fires, a lot of times you're gonna get fencing damage and, and fences burned up and those are costly to repair and, and put back. Um, and then, uh, as I was saying, you know, you might have restoration activities to go after those fires. So, you know, you've got a blend of situations, a dynamic situation, you've got opportunity and you've got challenges. Next slide. So getting to some of the stuff that we've actually done on the ground and, and when you, you know, first initiate a herd into, and we're using the vent system that, that Nathaniel uh, talked about. When you first uh, are getting your herd started, you're gonna go through a training exercise and, and Vince will step you through that. But basically it's about four days. And in our case, um, our training pastures were this area that is kind of diluted or shown by the light green zone. And that's fenced, barbed wire fence, good fence all the way around it. 
And on the fourth day, they have you go ahead and divide that training field in half with a virtual fence. And, and that's sort of the test of, okay, have the animals figured out what that tone and shock means and will they respect it? And so the blue dots are all the animal locations. This is about 150, 160 cows. All the animal locations logged once an hour over a 12 hour period after the virtual fence was turned on. And so you can say, you know, we did, we did have some leakage down here by the road, um, but you know, you were at 90% plus effectiveness. The picture on the right is about two hours after we turned the virtual fence off and everybody just went over to the other side just because we now could. So kind of reassuring that, yeah, okay, it, it does work um, as we hoped. Next slide. So our first real on-range application is, this is a BLM allotment uh, northeast of Susanville a little bit. Um, the area in red is the virtual fence boundary. The, the black lines are uh, conventional barbed wire fence. Um, and so what we were going to attempt to do is split this grazing unit in half, roughly. And, you know, there's a downward slope at the, at the bottom part here of the virtual fence. That's actually the top of the mountain. And it goes downhill towards the, the top of the, the page there. This water where you see this little faucet thing, that's that's a water source. That was our really good water. The objective is, you know, we'll let them have that water, but we don't, we will try to keep them off the rest of this allotment and uh, with the virtual fence. And it's about a mile of virtual fencing. Next slide. And so this is, you know, Nathaniel showed you what the interface looked like. This is an example of that. And this is on, I don't know, about three or four weeks into our, our grazing trial. On this day, we had 86 cows in, we had 12 out. And the point I always like to make about even the ones that, that do get out, um, you can see where they are. This all looks pretty small, um, you know, but again, this is about a 2000 acre uh, exposure here or grazing unit that we had. Um, and these cows are probably out by half a mile or so. So it looks like they're just barely out, but they are out by a ways. But again, with the vent system, you can see where they are. Next slide. Okay, this is a heat map. And, and all it really is, is it, again, it's showing where the animal distribution and where their occurrence was on the landscape over the grazing period. And this is about 35 days worth. And so the, the yellowish areas are the higher density use areas. The green is in the middle and kind of that purplish blue is where there was just a little bit of use. And a few things that stand out, you know, naturally you have some concentrated use around water, um, but even that was fairly light. Um, but this side over here, this lobe to the right, almost virtually no use whatsoever. That is a brushy hillside that is across the swale or across the draw from where the cows were. Where the cows were is a area that had burned in a wildfire in 2019. This is a 2023 map. This is four years post fire. Uh, real obvious that this is where they wanted to be. Um, and they wanted no part of that brushy slope on the opposite side. You can also tell that most of them were you know, within the zone. This is towards the top there of those ones that I showed you that had leaked out. The green that you see on the bottom of the sheet um, is actually some other cows that weren't, they were in another unit. And so they were actually not out, they were just nearby. Okay, next slide. So in 2024, we were gonna attempt to try to get some use on that uh, brushy slide. And you can see that we succeeded a little bit um, certainly we got more than we had the year before. Uh, next slide. And kind of how we ended up doing this was it was getting kind of close to 
when they were going to move the cows anyway. And uh, Janine Little noticed on the map that, hey, there's a bunch of cows that are kind of across the road, across the draw. Could we um, take this opportunity to build a new virtual fence around them, block them off and kind of force them up the hill? And so that's what she did. And it worked. There were still some cows that were over here in this first side where the burn was. We hoped that they would maybe join them. They, the cows on the brushy side, they really didn't. But uh, it just an, an example of being able to flexibly apply virtual fences just even mid-season. Next slide. Okay, here's another uh, project. Um, this particular grazing unit, this is about seven, 8,000 acres. This is about 500 cows, uh, 500 pairs, I should say. We wanted to test a couple things here. One is in this lower right corner, there's a good water source. We wanted to say, hey, what if we wanted to keep exclude that water source? Maybe there's, let's just say, if there was a restoration project or something, or just had been overused and needed some rest, would be able to, we'd be able to rest that from grazing with a virtual fence. And then just a couple of random exposures kind of in the middle, um, just kind of wanted to see, you know, what maybe there's, sometimes we'll have cultural resource sites that the agencies would like the cattle not to get into or something along those lines. And so uh, just wanted to set up some, some exposures. So this is about a week or so after the cattle were turned into this allotment, but the, the vences and exposures had not been turned on yet. Next slide. And so then this is what the use was for um, about a week or so after the vences were turned on. And we still had some getting down into this uh, water exposure in the right-hand corner, but it was becoming less and less over time. And, and the dots don't show up all that well on the right. They're a little faded for some reason. So you might have to just trust me. But over time, we had uh, less and less use within that uh, exposed area after we had turned the vents on. So it worked as we hoped. Next slide. The sort of random upland exclosures uh, work even better. Um, very little use after we turn them on. And again, they there may have been cattle in there when we first you know turned the vents on, and so they had to leave, and and then we kept them from coming back. You can a lot of times tell how well it's working. You see on the the picture on the right, there's kind of a line of dots on the right hand side of the exposure where cattle were coming into it and then um, running into the virtual fence and, and turning back. Next slide. The last thing I will share with you is we did a fuel break, a grazed fuel break. Uh, this one is about a quarter mile wide and about two and a half miles long. Again, 500 cows about on 500 acres, um, mid to late July. Next slide. And so our target was to remove 50% of the vegetation there to create, you know, if you were going to create like a defensible fuel space. Um, after seven days, we were at about 20%. After 12, about 40. And the cattle were moved at about 14 days. So we were really right on target with that 50% use. And we were also very happy to see that about 98% of the cows stayed within that fuel break zone. Uh, during those 14 days. Next slide. And so just kind of to summarize, you know, things that we've learned so far, um, you know, Nathaniel said, it's not 100%. Um, you know, Rory told us before we started, it's not going to be 100%. And that's definitely true, but, but you do come close. Um, large scale works well. Um, Definitely not a set it and forget it thing. Definitely not something you just like, this will go on autopilot. You do need to use it and actively engage the software and the system. Definitely a learning curve, but not unmanageable. And again, you know, we're just kind of at the beginning of this and uh, 
you know, our, our experience has been real good with the system. So thank you to all our cooperators. And that is it. And I don't know if I have any time left. We have time for one question. Um, we were asked, um, what is the minimum buffer area? So for example, how wide would a trail corridor need to be? You know, I, I am going to say a couple hundred yards. Um, we didn't do anything less than uh, maybe a quarter of a mile. Um, but you definitely don't want it too narrow because the GPS accuracy isn't perfect on these. And so you want to have a little bit of buffer to account for that. Um, so I'm going to say, you know, a couple hundred yards. And I will defer to other people on the panel that may know better. Thank you, David. That was super interesting. Uh, next up is Rory O'Connor, a rangeland research ecologist from the USDA to discuss his project using virtual fencing for fuel reduction in Southern Oregon. All right, go ahead to the next slide. All right, so thanks for inviting me. Um, and it's great to be talking to this group of people. Um, when we talk about virtual fencing, we need to talk about what the efficacy of the virtual fences and the success that you see from management with virtual fence. And so the efficacy is the proportion of time of cattle that are within the virtual fence management zones. Um, and so you can be extremely efficacious with your, with your, man your animals in the man management zone, but you may not have achieved management success uh, based off of that. And I'll walk through some examples uh, with our, um, uh, grazing projects that show like how you can have these different combinations and success is the achievement of management objective with virtual fence. So you set up a goal, you say, I want to graze this area out. Um, we're going to be on it for 50 days or 30 days or 10 days, however it is. And we're going to keep them within our bounds. And if you do that and you achieve like whatever your utilization goal is, um, then you see, you see success. Okay, next slide. And so for us out here in East, Southeastern Oregon, um, this year in particular has been a, a doozy with fires. Um, and I'm sure some of you in California have had a few fires this year. Um, we have a problem of a large complex landscape with high fine fuel loads um, on it. And we really want to use remotely sensed data to prioritize areas that we can graze on these BLM allotments or forest server allotments start forest service allotments, or even some larger private allotments uh, to where we can reduce the fine fuel load by 50%, which opens up the, the inner space between the plants, uh, gives some, some bare ground uh, in these, these more sagebrush arid systems. Uh, so fire can't be con connected as it goes across the landscape. And so we used uh, the fire probability map that came out uh, from Joe Smith and is being used by several agencies that highlights where fires are thought to will occur uh, based off of uh, past year's vegetation data. So cheat grass, annual gra other annual grasses, uh, areas that are very red have a higher probability of burning, areas on this map that are white have a very low probability of burning. Um, and this map gets updated annually uh, in March, April, and gets released to the to the public as well as to the agencies. Next slide, please. And so we use that map to over several years to create a what we call a coefficient uh, variation map. So we wanted to see how consistently are areas on some of our grazing landscapes staying at a high fire probability. So then we could prioritize uh, grazing those areas. And we're not talking about like, you know, 10 acre pastures, 100 acre pastures. We're actually going up to most of ours that we were trying to graze are 300 acre or plus pastures uh, that we wanted to see. And I know that is still small acreage uh, for these larger landscapes, but generally outside of that scale, you tend to have more discontinuous fuels and more changing uh, landscapes. And so you can see that we went from 2019 to 2020 and in 2020, or excuse me, 2021, and in 2021, we started our, our targeted grazing. And we selected three areas that had really high um, 
fire probabilities. Um, and so next slide. And so we set up our, our virtual fencing uh, using vents because uh, they were the only ones available at the time um, to, to see could we graze in these areas. And within our these uh, pastures, we set up our virtual fence. That's this currently this uh, square that you see where all the blue and orange dots are. Uh, and we set aside two thirds of it to be grazed, one third because it was a, an experiment we wanted to leave as kind of a control point. And we wanted to collect data at five minute intervals just to make sure everything is working. We know exactly where the animals are. Uh, the blue dots are the paired animals, the mama cows uh, with their calves. The orange dots are the dry cows. And we did have cows leave the virtual fence. Anytime you constrain animals to a very specific point on a landscape without uh, accounting for uh, landscape um, cues like uh, rock walls, barriers, drainage ditches, things like that, you're going to get leakage out of the, your virtual fence boundary because animals are going to want to wander to some of the areas that they know uh, more frequently. And so that's what we saw. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. And I'm going to get a little egg-headed with this with some, some figures. Um, so this is our first area that I just showed. And you can see that we had what we're calling 85% efficacy rate, where up until about uh, July 20th, we had really good success in keeping the animals contained. After that, they started wandering um, outside. And a lot of that was due to the, the paired cows leaving with their calves to go chase them, but also they were grazing outside of that area because uh, pickings were starting to get slim. Uh, we've found that once we get close to 40% utilization, 50% utilization, the animals want to start looking for, for greener pastures. Um, go ahead to the next slide. And when we looked at this area of about, I've been monitoring uh, utilization as well um, as standing crop. And after four weeks, we had utilized the whole area about 35%. So we said, we'll wait a little bit longer. Our target is 40 to 50, 40 to 60% utilization. After six weeks, we had 39.9, um, but that was weird because it's not a very large jump. And the reason being was we had this kind of rock scab land area right in the middle of the, our targeted area that did have a lot of uh, grasses and annual grasses present, but it had a basalt flow going through it. So a rock flow going through it that the cows did not want to go walking through. Um, and so, we removed them after seven weeks, and then when we took out that area, we ended up getting 57% uh, grazed, which is within our moderately grazed uh, point of view, and we had a 240 uh, pound per acre reduction in standing crop. So we felt like we, we met our goals, um, but the cows were telling us earlier on when we probably should have moved them, and uh, because we weren't looking for some of these basalt flows, that we were hoping for get them to get through. So knowing your animals, knowing um, knowing your location is very important about setting up targeted grazed areas. Next slide, please. So we moved. We added two. We had two other pastures uh, that were of similar size, uh, different geometries in in the virtual fencing uh, boundaries that we created. But as you can see, for that middle one, um, we had 98% efficacy. They weren't in there nearly as long because we learned our lesson in the first pasture. Um, and we had a 52% reduction in standing crop and we had a 38.2% utilization rate. Um, this met our goal, this met our management objective because we reduced that much standing crop. Um, in the last site, um, you can see that we had uh, a little less efficacy and we had some blips towards the end of that, that time range that the animals were leaving the pasture or our designated area more frequently. Um, and we only had a 30% reduction in uh, standing crop, but a 40% utilization. So landscape uh, heterogeneity does matter. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll tell you why some of it matters. So topography uh, can decrease your efficiently, efficiency for management uh, if used inappropriately. If you're not paying attention to where your rock walls are, uh, those those cliff bands, um, your rivers. Uh, if you look here at this this map, uh, you'll see the cir the circled area in blue. 
that was a vernal pond um, that we just had last year had a lot of really good water um, and it stayed full all year, uh, especially in the late summer in August when we were grazing this spot and all the, an all the calves wanted to go hang out in the pond and the few mothering animals that went and followed them uh, stayed there. So we had a break in our boundary. What should have happened was we should have flopped our uh, experimental design and incorporated that pond into our treatment. Um, just because the animals were to be there, they were using that water source uh, as a good water source. Um, and so understanding your landscape and how it changes annually means you have to go out there. You, like uh, David said, you can't just one and done and think it's over. You have to go out on the landscape, look at your animals, how are they going, look at the landscape that they're using and make adjustments as necessary. Go ahead, next slide, please. And so for our fuel reduction, um, the management objective, can we remote, use remotely sensed data to inform virtual fence boundaries to target graze fine fuels and reduce fine fuels between 30 and 50%. Um, so our results are for the efficacy. Yeah, we had varying degrees of efficacy, but we achieved those goals uh, for the most part in the pastures with greater than 85% efficacy. Um, success. Was the management objective met? Yes, they were all met. Uh, we opened up the, the inner space. There was no uh, thatch layers from the annual grasses. Um, we were able to keep the animals healthy. They still had good frame condition afterwards. Uh, so we, we met the objectives. Um, go ahead, next slide. So some take home messages. Uh, you wanna set yourself up for success and that's knowing your management goals. So virtual fence right now is a nice tool but it is a tool. Um, not every operation needs this tool, but if, you're, if you think yours does, then you should proceed with it. Um, know the landscape. Where are your barriers for, for rock walls, for uh, rivers, for vernal pools? Uh, know the animal's behavior. Uh, for virtual fencing, we've done research here um, where we've shown that virtual fence has no negative effect on the, the animal's behavior, whether they're a mothering cow or a dry cow. Um, and know the technology. The technology is getting easier to use uh, with every iteration of the, the systems. Um, and know that there are going to be some learning curves that you're going to have to get through. Uh, as David said, it's not an iron gate. Uh, it is a one-way fence. Um, you need to look at the whole effectiveness of the, your desired outcome um, and understand that you're not going to get every animal. But if you're getting 90% of your animals and you have say water in the center, and it's a dry lot for the rest of the pasture, you know your cows are gonna go back to the, to the boundaries and they're gonna go back to that water. So being, understanding that it's not iron gate. Um, and if the outcome isn't what you wanted, step back, think about how you can adaptively manage to make the outcome successful for using your virtual fencing. Um, you know, this, is, this allows you to have flexibility with your grazing, use it, um, sometimes it, you might get a crazy idea and you can try it. And if it doesn't work within the first couple of days, well, then you can go back and you can change it to something that's a little bit better. Um, so next slide. Uh, there's a whole bunch of us here at, in, East, in Southeastern Oregon, uh, part of a precision technology working group that's part of this project. Um, and also we have a bunch of YouTube videos that our group has uh, created that talks about how to get set up with virtual fencing, some barriers, and uh, we recently released four new videos um, of that that I can give to um, uh, Maddie that she can put out to the group, uh, but it's through the Rangelands Gateway, um, and there you have a whole section on virtual fencing and common questions that we have asked producers to answer, and they've uh, answered them to the best of their ability. So take questions if there's time, or we'll just move on. Rory, I have one. Um, what's the timeline from changing the lines to activating the collars? Yeah, so for activating collars and changing lines, it really depends on your topography. The, the greater the topography with elevation or, um, you, or hills in the way of your towers, um, it can take longer. Um, if you have an animal close to a tower, within 15, 20 minutes, you're gonna have all the animals um, uh, updated with that new boundary. Um, 
but it really is topography dependent on whether or not they have access or line of sight to those lower end um, antennas. Thank you, Rory. That's a great presentation and some really good resources that we'll be sure to share with the attendees. Um, next up, we have Brian Allen from UC Cooperative Extension to discuss a few different virtual fencing projects he's been working on over the last few years. Awesome. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a few of the uh, projects that we've been working on. Um, there will be things that I'm going to say that are echoing what our other presenters have said. So it's kind of cool to hear about their work. It's, it all sounds very similar. Um, so um, next slide, please. So my name is Brian Allen. I'm with the UC Cooperative Extension Office. Um, I'm based out of Amador County in the Sierra um, I'm part of a larger team that's funded by NRCS grant, the Conservation Technical Assistance, um, Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative grant. Um, we're a team of um, farm advisors, livestock advisors, um, as well as some professors at UC Davis campus, and of course, a handful of local um, uh, or California native ranching families. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm not going to talk about so much um, the details of how virtual fence works, because I think that's been covered really well. I just really want to jump into some of the applications we're doing. A lot of these are smaller scale, so 100 animals or fewer. Um, the first ones will be with uh, vents, and then I'll talk about Gallagher as well. So the first one I want to talk about, um, and I could spend an hour talking about this one uh, project, but it's uh, working with a local livestock producer. She's really who got us into virtual fence. Um, she has a grazing allotment on the El Dorado National Forest. Uh, the Caldor fire burned through there and burned the top third of her range. That's that line going through the middle. It's the burn scar. And it wiped out a bunch of her fence line. Um, she didn't know what to do. She had no option to go back into her range without that fence. And so she learned about virtual fencing, um, collared all 100 of her animals, took them there next summer. The National Forest was super supportive of it, um, and it, it worked really well. So 90% uh, of the animals were contained outside of that fire line, um, and then about 10% continued into it, but were contained within her range while using virtual fence. Um, again, there's a lot that I could say about this project, but I'll continue on. Um, in 2023, on that same range, we identified an area that was uh, botan sensitive. There's a California Native Plant Society's uh, rare Halicordis species that grows in this sort of lava cap. Um, next slide, please. And so we put an exclusion around that area. Um, you'll see it's a, the satellite image is horrible, but you'll see sort of an occlusion area. Um, and it, so that's part of the, the site. And then it also continued down um, to where a lot of those other blue dots are. So we cut that site in half. You can see uh, most of the animals were excluded. There were a few that went in and that's echoing what other people said. It's not about 100% of anything. It's just where the majority of the animals where you wanted them or not wanted them for the majority of the time. So next slide, please. So here's an example of some of the data. Um, cows work on the buddy system. So these are a pair of cows. Uh, so at three in the morning, they were way off to the west. They kind of ambled over, bumped up to that exclusion line, and then, you know, 30 minutes later, decided they didn't want to be there anymore. So next slide. And then, of course, for every success, you have some failures. So here's another pair. They went through that exclusion area once decided to do a U-turn and go all the way back. And so they they busted through twice, but that was by far the exclusion. Um, uh, keep going, please. Uh, the majority of the time, there was no animal presence in there. So over the 51 days that we monitored this and had an active exclusion, uh, two and a half hours of detectable animal presence inside that area. And I'm saying that because every GPS point was on a 30 minute interval. And so there were five points within that area. And within that, um, the area that we left open, we calculated there's about 29 animals, 29 hours of animal 
presence. So it worked pretty well. And there was visually, it was identical. So next slide, please. Um, another trial that we did was to see if we could do targeted grazing on uh, invasive Medusa head grass. So this was in the Sierra foothills. Um, we had an area that hadn't been grazed in about 20 years. About 80% of that pasture was covered in really thick Medusa head thatch. Um, so this was done in the wintertime. We collared 25 animals with fence collars, and we contained them within a three-acre uh, strip and let them graze for eight days. So next slide, please. And so um, it worked really well. So over on the left-hand side, you'll see all the blue dots. That's where we contained them. There was a physical barbed wire fence on the west and the north, but everything on the east and the south was all virtual fence. All the kind of confetti of rainbow colors were individual animals that would leave because this kind of coincided with their calving season. So a lot of them wanted to leave, they calved, and then usually would come back. We were supplementing them with hay, so I think that was an attractant to have them go back into the grazing area. Um, but it worked really well. They grazed it from about 5,000 pounds per acre down to about 520. Um, and that was just through a combination of trampling as well as grazing. And 95% of the time, the animals were where we wanted them to be. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, and then so this is actually the exact, oop, go back, please. <laughs> this is actually the exact same footprint. We grazed it again in this spring because there was still a lot of living Medusa head grass. Um, there's a short little window. If you don't know, if you aren't familiar with Medusa head, um, it's it's fairly non-palatable to animals. It has a high silica content, so they prefer to browse other things. But there's a short little window at the beginning of May for about two weeks where most of the other grass is starting to go out. And that's a time when you can kind of target that Medusa head. Um, and the seeds on the Medusa head itself are still relatively immature. Um, and so we wanted to see if when the grass was still growing, if we could target that to prevent those seeds from actually ending up on the landscape. So next slide. Oh, and this was done using Gallagher collars or the e-shepherd collars. And so here's, um, it's a mess, uh, but these are all of the animals locations within that trial. Um, we had no animals leave except for the very last day. Um, we don't, we weren't there and there was a time where the tower wasn't working, which that wouldn't impact the caller's ability to contain the animal. We just lost the location data. So I drove out there to check on them and something happened. Either they grazed it enough or they heard a loud noise and, um, and they were all outside of the grazing area. But that kind of goes back to what Nathaniel said about competition between different pressures. Mm -hmm. So something happened where the animals decided they no longer want to be there. They want to be outside, but for the, I think, 10 day grazing period, they were all contained where we wanted them to be. So next slide, please. And so this is what it looked like towards the end of that trial. Um, the goal here wasn't to graze it to the ground. It was just primarily to graze seed heads. And so especially in the foreground, you can see there's still grass there, but compared to the non-grazed area, most of those seed heads were gone. Um, if you're familiar with our livestock advisor, Dan Macon, he talks about um, a thing called the zone of repugnance, which is where the animals tend to go to the bathroom a lot. That was towards the back end of this uh, area where those trees are, and that's where the animals would hang out during the hotter parts of the day. That area was grazed a little bit less, um, but everything in this foreground was grazed really intensely. Um, you'll see that there's some green in the field. That's Italian thistle, and the animals wanted nothing to do with it. They were kind of bobbing and weaving around it, and it all had seed heads on it. So that was kind of not a goal of the trial, but it was an interesting result to see. So next slide, please. So in June of this year, uh, or I'm sorry, July, we wanted to see if we'd use this for field strip uh, grazing. Um, this is a pasture that's right outside the city of Sutter Creek. Uh, the fire department there uh, mandates the property owners in that wooey space um, create a fuel perimeter that's 12 feet wide on their properties. 
Um, and so we did some virtual fence boundaries that were, I think about 120 feet wide. Um, and we contained animals there. This was a site that is in the process of being developed and sold for uh, housing lots. And so there's a new road that was put in that has some oak trees along it that were mandated to be planted. Um, so we wanted to try to avoid that as well as sort of a secondary objective. So next slide. And these were also with Gallagher collars. So we collared 37 animals and we put them in this area. Um, they did really well. Um, you can see on the left hand side, uh, there's a, a really kind of like really good line in the area, line in the grass, I should say, um, between where the grass is growing and where they were targeted. It's a little hard to see just because the colors don't uh, contrast as well, but we were really impressed by the results. So next slide. Um, I should say we were impressed by how well it was able to contain them within a really narrow field strip. Um, I don't know if anyone else saw this this year, but um, this is an amazing year for forage. And we had so much out in this area that was beyond normal. Um, so at the beginning, we had about 4,200 pounds per acre of forage, which is more than we were anticipating and more than the time we allotted to this trial. So we would have liked to see the animals graze it down to about 500 pounds per acre. But by the time the trial ended, they'd gone down to about 1,500. Um, Nevertheless, I'm pretty convinced we could have contained them in that area to graze it a lot lower if we had time. Um, and over the course of that, the Gallagher collars contain the animals 99% of the time. Um, we did have a few animals that sort of slipped out, so you can see that in this photo. Um, but the only water source in the field was within the virtual fence boundary. So even if they left, they had a good reason to come back, and they usually stayed when they did. Um, the other thing we noticed was uh, we were successful in keeping them off of that newer paved road. Um, There's a couple of dots where animals crossed it, but for the most part, it they stayed there. Next slide. This is kind of a cool result. So a lot of the times um, we hear that animals get used to the audio warning alone, but this kind of shows that. Uh, so the blue is the percentage of time the animals were responding just to audio and orange is when they also needed that electrical stimulus. So during that training period, um, and these with, were animals that had zero exposure to virtual fence before this. So during the training period, um, about 75% of the time, that audio cue is sufficient to contain them, but they still needed that electrical stimulus about 25% of the time. But as you see, as time goes on, and this is I think exactly 30 days towards those last like week or so that need for that electrical stimulus to contain them in that really narrow field break was only about two to 5% of the time. So that was really cool. Next slide, please. So this is our current project. It's ongoing. It'll be going until probably November of this year. Um, this is upslope in the mixed conifer belt. We're, um, where we moved our herd to Sierra uh, Pacific Industries Timberland, um, again with Gallagher collars. Uh, we're working with a forester uh, that works for SPI. Um, there's an area where there's about a two mile long logging road and it's really densely covered in Cianothus, uh, which is also called deer brush. It's really desirable forage for cows, but it's also able to really grow um, a lot. There's no grazing pressure. So we have identified an area that where there's a lot of this brush and we've contained this an, these animals on about a two mile strip. I think it's about 250 acres. And the goal is just to browse that brush back to maintain that logging road, uh, reduce fuel loads, and then also um, make it a better growing condition for their desirable timber species. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is what that looks like. It's the orange is the virtual fence boundary and the white is a barbed wire fence. Um, and so it's been pretty successful. Um, I say pretty successful because what this doesn't show is one of the challenges that we've come across. Um, we have about 100 animals in this area and only 35 of them have virtual fence collars. And so we have some animals 
with no virtual fence who can enter that area and graze. And when they do, sometimes they're they're dragging along a buddy with them that has a virtual fence collar. And so that's just a challenge. It's those, they don't really mix is, uh, as far as we can tell. Most of the animals with virtual fence collars will stay where you want them, but we do see that you know, again, it comes down to pressures that they're, if they want to stick with that herd and that herd, they don't all have a virtual fence collar, you're going to lose some animals. And during this talk, I've been watching this map because we have two animals that are way out of bounds now. And I'm talking with the rancher about how we're going to get them back. And if we can put a virtual fence enclosure around those two. And so it's, you, you're always watching your system. Um, but, but overall they're doing a really good job. And when every week, when we go and check on the ground, you can see more and more of that uh, brush being grazed. So next slide. And that's that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. I don't know if there's Brian, time for um, can you compare and contrast um, vents in Gallagher to the best of your ability? Um, yeah. Um, I, they, they both work really well on all the applications that we've used them for. Um, we've used them both on annual rangelands as well as up in forested rangeland. Um, one thing I'll say is we are we were starting with an older yeah. version of events callers, and so they still had some bugs that I think have been fixed in their system compared to the e shepherd callers, which we got and they're they're newer. Um, but they they both worked really well for almost all the applications we tried. The containment is never exactly 100%, but it's usually very close. And, um, and we always saw results from our trials. Um, the big difference, uh, I think, is perhaps the battery. Um, considering that we're leaving these animals on, with the last trial I talked about, kind of in a remote area, targeting brush on sort of a narrow strip, um, it is really nice to have that solar panel just knowing that we won't be able to access those animals to swap out batteries if we need to. Great. Thank you, Brian. That was super interesting, the slide um, about the audio responses versus the shocking. It's really yeah. nice to see. Um, well, now that we've gotten to hear all about the research side of things, we get to hear from a rancher in Los Angeles County that has been using this technology for the last few years. Mike, can you tell us about your operation and your experience using the virtual fencing on your herd? Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to. And uh, so what my experience has largely echoed what the, what the different uh, other presentations have said. Um, I, what I, I operate, like you said, in Los Angeles County, mostly it's a high desert type of environment. Uh, fairly rugged, uh, range from uh, around 2,000 feet to 5,000 feet at, at the upper end. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, ridges and and draws and, and stuff like that. And um, so, but the challenge that I had, is I had about 12,000 acres that were, that was not cross-fenced. And, and due to the conditions of the lease and different things, it wasn't practical to do that, I was largely um, controlling my cattle or, or targeting my grazing through herding, which um, since I do this generally by myself, it's it's easy to get behind on and, and the cattle would get scattered a little bit. So, and then I spent a lot of time just keeping them together. So largely I got the virtual fence to use as a backup. And then I concentrate my cattle um, for herd effect through through herding horse with horses and 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 dogs, um, the my as as said the, the effectiveness of the virtual fence to to hold the cattle in a given area is really really good largely not a hundred percent. The really nice thing though about the the ability of the tracker the collar tracks you know I know when my cattle are not in the area and to, and to a large extent I can identify where they are where they are which saves me a lot of time and if I have to go and and move them back with the other cattle so um, it, it's been a very effective way of uh, backing up another really 
nice thing I like about the virtual fence as opposed to putting in cross fences is the flexibility of um, building the fences. I can, uh, you know, really, I don't, like I think a guy made a comment earlier, once you put a fence in, it's good for that year, but you, it might not be ideal for the next year. This you can adjust um, how you concentrate the cattle really, really effectively. And, and take better advantage of, of your pastures. The, um, and, and the, uh, also I, I use the vents and their, their support team, uh, is, is very good at, at helping you work through some, whenever you are having challenges. Uh, some of the challenges, uh, with is, is the battery life is definitely an issue. If, it's not so much an issue if, if I don't try to concentrate my cattle, if I use fairly large paddocks. Um, right now, I'm probably running about 1,500 to 2,000 acres uh, with the fence. And then, I can't, like I said, I concentrate the, for herd effect with the, with the horseback. And that, that's better. If, well, if they're the second year, I, or the start of the second year, I put the batteries in. I started getting a little lazy and started trying to let the the fence do or the this the bat barriers concentrate my cattle and i saw a big impact when i did that on on battery life so um they seem to you you have really good containment once the once batteries start to fail uh you get a few collars if a collar collar couple collars fall off or otherwise fail um those cattle that aren't getting impacted with the shock sometimes will tend to draw the cattle that don't, um, and it's not a big deal. Most of the cattle will still stay, but you'll see a little more escape. Um, sometimes, especially with pyres where you'll have a cow and a calf that can walk through the fence without getting impacted. And then another calf will go through and then that calf mom will have to go through. So um, that's one of the challenges with the system. It's, it's not a huge challenge, it's just something as a gentleman earlier said, you just can't set this up and forget about it. You got to stay on top of it. Um, the uh, it the other thing is that the, there's a learning curve when you're setting up your boundaries. Um, if you put your boundaries up, uh, you, you take advantage of the terrain and watch the terrain to where the like if you're going uphill and they run into a boundary, they're a lot less likely to push through than if they're going downhill, for example. And in areas where you got to put a boundary in a place that's going to receive a lot of pressure from cattle, what I've found works pretty good is I'll put a backup boundary. So where the ones they get through there, they run into another barrier. And then if they, you know, so two or three backup boundaries and that, that pretty much turns back all but the most dedicated cows in my experience. But, um, so what I'm going to do is, rather than go on and on about stuff that maybe nobody cares about, I'm going to leave a little more time for questions so I can direct, um, I can answer some specific questions that some of you may have. I appreciate that, Mike. Two things I wanted to clarify. How large of an area are you using it on? Or does that vary? This is, well, the, the total acreage that I'm using it on is 12,000. I'll The paddocks that I make it will vary uh now usually around 1500 to 2000 okay. and it's so um and, and even at that there's still certain areas that'll get a lot more be tested a lot more just because of the nature of the terrain now occasionally i'll use it to concentrate them in an area but i i got to be aware that when i do that then i'm definitely going to impact the battery life of those collars and and the nature, uh, it's its a little hard for me to replace collars right now more than once a year. So I'm, I'm trying to get a year's worth of battery life out of the collars. And so that's why I tend to back off. If I had a, if, and I'm looking at managing the workflows in a different way where it might make, be a little more convenient for me to change the batteries twice a year. But this year I didn't try to do that. And so I just kept my, my paddocks 1,500 to 2,000 acres. Gotcha. And ideally, 
Um, are you trying to call her all the cows in that herd? Or do you feel like there's a number where like if 80% are called or that's going to keep the majority in, or are you trying to have a caller on every single head? Well, you could, you could probably control generally the, the bulk of the herd with 80%, but the problem that you got is some of the callers are going to come off. They're going to catch it on brush or trees and some of the callers are going to fail. Um, so what I would what I would do is I I would suggest that a guy collars everything that he's got, and then you'll still have some that failed, but um, that won't be as significant as if you start with eighty percent, and then you have some fail, and you're down to seventy percent. Or I mean, I'm just throwing out numbers, not that I know. Yeah, um, I I think he'd be way ahead to, and it'd be well worth the money to collar all your cows. Yeah, great. Thank you. Go ahead, Maddie. Um, we have a few questions in the chat for you. Um, this one's kind of a two-part question. Um, what would you say the vent vent system costs for you per cow? And then has that cost been worth it? Um, it's definitely worth it. Uh, to break it down, like like I say, I I started with I got one tower that I moved that I put on a trailer. Now, Vince doesn't like you to do this, um, but uh, just the nature of what I'm going to do. I, I keep all my cows, or I try to keep all my cows in one herd. So I put a collar on a trailer, and then I'll move that trailer according to where my cows are positioned. So that was a $10,000 investment. And then by putting one battery in a year, it's uh, it's $500 or, or $50 per cow is what it cost and and for the the man the level of management that i'm going to get i was in a spot where i was either going to have to hire a guy to help me part-time to help me manage the cows to keep them to control distribution uh cross fencing wasn't an option but if, if even if it was it was an option that was prohibitively expensive over time so um so for me, the the cost of the vent system made a lot of sense. And after I got the initial tower expense out of the way, I, I was, uh, like I said, I'm 50 bucks a year per cow. So um, that's that's well worth it for the, for the degree of control that I get over my animals. Great. Robin, I'll hand it back to you. It looks like, let's see. Um, how many years have you been using the system, Mike? I'm just under two years. I I, uh, I I got my first collars, or I got my tower December two years ago. I probably got things running up and running around March of that following year. So, um, so yeah, my experience is a little, it isn't, isn't long, but um but I'm say, I, I've, I've not, already noticed a very positive effect. I haven't, I haven't uh, increased numbers or, or done anything like that yet. I feel like I definitely could. Um, I just, how's it, you know, I don't, doesn't make too much sense for a guy to buy cows right now. But uh, I'm, right now I'm letting my pasture, I'm kind of trying to build up my pasture. I have noticed and I, how much does it do to my management and how much does it do because we've had a little more rain the last couple of years? I, I'm definitely seeing an increase in some of the species that I'm trying to manage for. Uh, some of the perennials and, and bunch grasses that I, that I hope to reestablish on the ranch, I am seeing an uptick in that. Um, so I am noticing some positive changes in the landscape. I, I got to remember, and the thing I had, I struggled with first is, is to, to use, I use this system in more of a dynamic fashion, um, which like, like a lot of times you go to a small pa a paddock system or a, or a herd grade uh, register where you got, you go in there, you say, okay, I have this much feed in this pasture. I can be in there for, for 15 or 20 days or, or whatever. And then you move and you got this schedule all planned out. Uh, and, and and that might work. Uh, it's not the way I found it. I had to adjust to say it's a lot more uh, 
based on what am I seeing when I'm out there with my cows? How's the pasture doing? Where are the concentrations? Where are the cattle wanting to be? And where do I want them to be? Um, and so it's more of a fluid type of a management than maybe a prescribed type of management is what I found is more effective in in the way I'm using this back, this thing on my ranch. I mean, putting it on the trailer is ingenious. That's a great idea. Yeah, well, like um, I say, the, the guys at Vince might not like that, but uh, I've talked to them about it, and, and yeah, it, it's a pretty good system. If you, it, it has some, it has some drawbacks because obviously, if if I had all my ranch covered with towers, obviously to save the time of moving the towers, but it, but it also can provide data a little more data that I, I might lose something in the data and the data analysis that I would gain if I was covered more completely with ours. Gotcha. Okay, well, we're going to jump over to our last presenter since some people are asking about equip and funding. And then if we have time, we'll open it back up um, to you, Mike. So thanks so much for coming on today and really giving us your firsthand experience. Um, our last speaker of the day is Alan Bauer. He's the State Rangeland Management Specialist for NRCS, and he's going to talk to us about possible programs and funding opportunities coming down the line. Okay. Um, well, so my presentation is going to be pretty short. Um, there's a lot of information right now that we out here in the States don't have. Um, so it might take a little, it's gonna take a little bit of time. This is not something that we currently have uh, as far as a cost share, but we're looking at it for uh, fiscal year 2025, which technically would start uh, October 1st. Um, the other thing I wanna emphasize here is that as with NRCS, everything we do is based on a conservation plan. So, um, if this is technology, if this is something that would be uh, adopted, it would be something you would work with your local field office and the and the planner that you're working with to put into the conservation plan. You know, it could be a situation where that this technology is not it's not going to replace anything. It's not going to take away regular fencing or anything like that. So the idea is to make sure that your conservation plan um, is the foundation for whatever you're doing and that this is the right technology and the right uh, practice for you. So um, anyway, so I'll, I'll get into what we have here. So um, as you can see on this slide, um, it's one concept, multiple practices and scenarios. So what the design is, is to have fence, which is our practice code 382. Um, it's gonna be, that would be the year, the first year and that covers the cost of purchasing and getting the equipment up and running. So the idea is that um, then following that in years two through five within the con within the conservation plan and the contract would be grazing management, which would be performed with the intended desire and effects to make sure that the technology is working and the management aspect is actually taking place and is, um, is it's following the intended use of that or the intent the intention of that conservation plan and the grazing management plan that goes goes along with it so okay let's go to the next slide okay so i'll start i'll kind of go uh chronologically uh backwards first so grazing management again is the 528 scenario for virtual fence in years two through five so, and the idea is what will be covered in that as far as the cost amount is the economics associated with that activity. So the grazing management design and implementation, the monitoring activities, because that is a requirement within our 528 grazing management, is that um, to make sure that the, the management that's going on is matching the intended use and the annual subs uh, subscription fees that might go along with this technology. So those are those are the ideas in those latter parts of the plan and contract um, if, you, if one is awarded. Now this, the other thing I should mention is all of this information I'm giving you is under our program, which is EQIP, which is our Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And um, to 
to my knowledge at this point in time we don't i don't know that there this has been adopted into the conservation stewardship uh program as an enhancement um that might be coming um it might already be here it just hasn't been delivered to the states yet but this is so the information i'm giving you is based upon if if your plan gets moved into an equip contract okay so the other thing, um, so we can go to the next slide. And again, this is a this is a short and sweet, but um, the fence scenario. So that would be in year one of the of the plan and contract. There are four different types of scenarios that fall under that three eighty two practice. So the one scenario is a small herd for sheep and goats. They did not give a definition in the in the description about what is classified as small. I'm sure they're not referring to the size of animal, but the herd size. But um, they're using a typical size of about 50 animals as the baseline to come up with their cost amounts. The small herd for cattle operation is anything that's less than 400 acres. Um, again, a typical herd side herd size to calculate that compensation is again about 50 animals or less than 400 acres. So I, I saw in the chat somebody asking about acreage size. So in our calculations, it would, that would anything, um, it is applicable to something that would be under 400 acres. Um, medium herd uh, for cattle. So that herd size is, a, is 150 animals or less or the and or the ranch size is greater than 400 acres. Okay, and then a large herd size, a large herd for cattle is a herd size of 150 or greater, and or the ranch um, size is greater than 400 acres. So that was broken down um, in a sense to based upon how much money that could be set aside um, for that. So I'm sure a lot of people are asking, okay, well, how much money is that? So I can't give you exact definitions now because like on my first slide, it says a lot of this is still subject to change. It's not, um, it's, we, this is not 100% adopted into our cost list um, at the time of, of, of me giving this presentation. I, I Yesterday I did speak to um, our regional rangeland specialist yesterday and she confirmed that there could be changes even be, uh, before this is all finalized, but I will give you a rough estimate and the rough estimate for the small herd size for uh, for the sheep and goats and the small herd size estimate for cattle is around the 20 to $25,000 range. Medium is gets around the $30,000 range and the large herd gets around the $50,000 range. But again, that is not finalized and that's not, um, that's not 100% as of right now. So um, that's really all I have. That's that's more of a less an update. <laughs> um, I will I will say this that we are also actively involved in um, uh, studies um, like uh, the one that uh, Brian was talking about through um, a GLCI grant through our agency and other grants. Uh, uh, and so that we have we have been able to help fund some of the research on some of this um, and not only in California, but other states. And I think some of the maybe the final is finalizing of numbers that might come out in and later years might be based upon some of the uh, results of that research. So um, but those those projects are not completed yet. And um, but it is encouraging to see what has been presented here that th looks like things are looking really positive. So uh, I'm available for questions now. Um, Alan, are those estimated um, dollar amounts for the first year only? No. So, um, so if you're doing, well, okay. Yeah. If you're doing the fence, then yes. Then the, if you're just, if that is the only practice and scenario, that is going to be done, then it would just be that first year that it's installed. The years after that, you would have, to, the landowner would have to also incorporate grazing management, and then the costs are extended out 
so for um let me go let's go back one slide real quick to, so i can be a little bit clear clear about this so um so so for that for the um for the grazing management side from years two to five that would be yeah those estimates that i just gave you would be under the grazing management side of it now i'm going to quickly look because that's a really good question and i want to make sure i got this right uh Yeah, let me quick. I'm sorry for the delay, but again, like I said, I want to make that's sure, great. I want to make sure I get this right. Um, yeah, for the fence, for the fence, it's roughly in the twenty thousand uh, range, and so forth. So those numbers, I'm sorry, was was for the grazing management, for but for the actual um, uh, grazing management post. Um, so years two through five, it's roughly around ten thousand dollars. So I hope that made that clear. So the numbers I gave you was for the fence. The 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 years two through five, the roughly about ten thousand dollars would cover the grazing management practice um, post installation. Does that makes sense. Did I get that? <laughs> I think so. Um, well, thank it's, you, it's, Alan. It's confused. The, the problem is a lot of this is confusing and a lot of it is sort of being uh, coming out. Um, and I think that's because uh, the public has, has, you know, made it clear that they would like to see NRCS adopt this. And we're trying to do our best to catch up with, um, we tend to be sort of locked in place with the things that we do know. And this is new technology that we're trying to adapt adopt absolutely it's yeah. super encouraging to hear that it was on the docket to be included in equip i think a lot of ranchers are really excited about that so we will we will keep in touch with you on that for updates uh for sure but thanks again for being willing to come on i know it's hard when you don't have anything concrete but it was really um nice to hear what's what's coming down the line yeah it's it's getting more concrete and hopefully within the next I mean, the information I, I've given you, it might hold, but I just didn't, I didn't want to promise anything right now. Absolutely. Um, well, with that, it's, it's 1230 or a little past. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you all the panelists for taking the time to come on and present and be willing to take questions. Um, as I said before, this has been recorded. We will send that out to all the attendees and those who registered along with the contact information um, for any follow-up questions. A survey is going to pop up after you close out. If you could fill that out, I'd really appreciate it. And just one more plug for that workshop that we have in Stockton on October 1st. It's going to be a succession planning workshop in person. Um, so if you have any more questions on that, feel free to reach out to me. And I hope you guys all just have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.